thanks for inviting me um, to talk this evening. Um, pleasure to be speaking to Bang Bangabur Group in the Arvon branch um, of the North Wales Wildlife Trust. Um, and I'll do my best to make it an interesting talk on um, managing woodlands for water. Um, but first of all, I just want to um, plug a few things here about um, joining North Wales Wildlife Trust. So please, if you're not a member already, uh, please join us. It's, um, it really helps what we do, um, all, all the great work that we do on reserves and living landscapes. So um, please, if you haven't joined, please try and join if you can. Uh, th there's a link in the middle or sign up for our free e-newsletter. Um, there's a link for the newsletter. Um, and there's lots of other ways you can support our work, particularly by signing up as a volunteer. If you'd like to join us volunteering on reserves or on uh, private farmland and living landscapes. Um, also a mention of the Lacey Lecture coming up. Um, it's the small things that matter, life and times of Dr. Erica McAllister. Uh, it's a face-to-face -face one this year um, at Venue Cymru, Saturday 20th of November. Um, all the details are on the website if you'd like to get tickets. I believe there's still tickets available, Mark. Um, let Mark maybe um, answer any questions on booking for that. But uh, there are the details for, the, for this year's Lacey Lecture, which will be should be really interesting. Um, so I'll start the presentation. I'm Johnny Holson. I'm the project manager on the Woodlands for Water project, which is funded by uh, the Welsh Government and the European Union through the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development. So we're funded until March next year. Um, so the presentation, this is a, an image that shows the area that we work in, in the the project focuses on the Allen and Quila River catchments in North East Wales. Here's a nice photograph of um, the River Allen just above loggerheads. Gives you an idea of the type of habitat that we're dealing with and you know why it's such an interesting area for wildlife. Um, so you know I think that gives a good idea of the importance of our project related to wooded habitats um, around the catchment of the River Allen particularly. And this is just a map that shows the number of farms that we work with I'm not going to go into the work that we do with farms so much. Uh, I'm going to talk more about the importance of wooded habitats and managing them and planting trees for water. But this gives, just gives you an idea of um, the, you know, the scale of the, the area that we work in and the number of farms that we're actively working with at the moment. So presentation's going to be split into two themes, really. Um, firstly, about planting the right tree in the right place. Uh, and the approach that we're advocating through the Woodlands for Water project, um, trying to emphasise this, um, and then also the importance of sustainable management of wooded habitats. And by wooded habitats, I mean hedgerows, parkland, woodland and forest. So um, I thought I'd start with this magnificent tree, um, which is colloquially known as the spider rowan, um, which might well be the oldest rowan tree in Britain which grows on the edge of Penaclodio Hill Fort at 1,400 feet in the Cluidian Hills. Um, your guess is as good as mine as to how this tree has survived. We think it might have blown over in a storm with heavy snowfall in 62 or 63, and it's blown over such a size. I mean, as you know, Rowan doesn't very rarely gets beyond 100 years of age, but this tree is mapped on the first edition Ordnance Survey. So we know it's getting well beyond 150 years old. Um, we haven't done any dendrochronology, but measuring the circumference of the crown, it's almost 70 meters in circumference, which would make it according to experts at Oxford University, potentially the oldest rowan tree in Britain. Um, rowan, the reason I've started with this is probably our most resilient tree in the Welsh uplands. Um, it really can survive in so many strange places. This tree has blown over and suckered, grown again um, in about 12 different locations. And it's what's known as a phoenix tree. So very, very special tree. We're in talks with Caddo at the moment because it's right on the outer ramparts of the of one of the largest hill forts in Britain. So whether we protect it with a fence, whether we're able to, we're just having discussions about that now. But I just wanted to mention about this amazing rowan and how resilient rowan is um, in our in our Welsh landscape. And here's another tree in the right place. This is an ancient sessile oak on a protected parkland um, just outside Nanach on the Mould Denby Road. 
um, we've put the investment in with this landowner to protect this last sessile oak. Again, looking at the Ordnance Survey map, this parkland you know, once had 60, 70 of these sessile oak trees, and this is the last one. Um, provide shade and shelter for livestock in the hot summer months and in the harsh winter months um, for the cattle and sheep. And unfortunately, they've been browsing the roots um, and, and the um, around the base of the tree, and it's quite heavily compacted. And you know, if you talk about compaction around a tree, we're not just talking about the immediate area around the trunk. We're talking twelve times that diameter. So the the fact the tree is giving shade and shelter for livestock is great, but really we need more of them and more wood pasture type habitats um, where livestock and trees are integrated. So we've decided to release the funding to enable this um, quite fancy parkland tree cage, um, just to the just for the sole reason that this was the last sessile oak tree on this parkland, and hopefully it'll protect the tree and enable us to collect acorns for our tree nursery, which I'll come on to in a minute. Here's another very rare tree that's reached a great size. This is Tilia cordata, the small leaf lime. If you find this tree in a woodland, you're, you're sure enough it's going to be an ancient woodland because small leaf lime is associated with ancient woodland. Um, before, before the Ice Age, it was actually the most dominant, most common tree in the British Isles. And in Bielowice Forest in Poland, wherever there's a windblow event, the tree that forces the pioneer into the canopy is small leaf lime. So it's a very important tree species, which we should have more of. Um, very important for wildlife. The amount of hoverflies that were feeding on this tree when I photographed it back in July was incredible. So we, again, we've, we've had permission from the landowner to collect seed from this tree for our tree nursery. Um, and it's on an ancient drover's road just outside um, Flangoflin. Um, very interesting area for ancient trees and there's obviously a lot of cultural heritage to do with the drovers and how they maintain these old hedges and trees that line the, the, the paths when they are taking the cattle to market. But this, as far as we know, in northeast Wales, we've only been able to confirm this as a true small leaf line. And using a drone, quite useful at this time of year, going on to another rare tree, this is the wild service tree. Um, and I'll just skip to the next slide it give you an idea. Um, by using a drone, we're able to identify where those rarer trees are um, in ancient woodlands. And you can see there's a, um, if you can see my cursor, there's a cluster of wild service tree, Sorbus terminalis, just here. There's one here and there's some over here. Um, so, you know, at this time of year, because they change colour, the carotenoids in the changing of the leaves very distinctive with wild service tree. They change colour before other broadleaf trees. And again, if you find the wild service tree in a woodland, sure enough, it's going to be an ancient woodland. And this year particularly seems to be a good seed year for wild service. So we have been out the past couple of weeks on those sites that we've got permission from to collect seed for our nursery. And there's a close up of the leaves if um, you're not familiar with the tree. So there's the wild service tree on the left. Um, looks quite like a maple leaf, but quite uh, elongated. Um, and these berries called checkers, which um, pubs, particularly pubs in the south of England, were known as checkers, named after these berries, because in medieval times, they were a delicacy served with ale. Um, so apparently you can't eat them, I think, after they've been some sort of process. Um, but obviously we, we're after the seeds and very good for wildlife. So if you are collecting seeds, you know, really you should only take um, a third uh, of what's there to allow the rest uh, for wildlife to forage and also to allow natural regeneration in those woods which need, is needed. And on, on the right is a Tilia cordata um, uh, leaf, a small leaf lime with um, the bracts and the, which will be the flowers that was taken um, sort of end of July, early August. So um, I, I've just mentioned, given a selection of um, trees that we find in northeast Wales that we um, you know, put a lot of work into identifying where these native rare trees are, which I think is very important for anybody serious about conservation and working with restoring wooded habitats. But this slide's quite interesting um, because it shows um, how we compare um, 
with our European neighbours in terms of uh, diversity of our forests. And you'll see the UK is very, very poor. You'll see the bottom pie chart there. 56% um, um, of those UK forests are made up of only one species. And, we, and that's without a doubt Sitka spruce, um, predominant, predominantly planted in Scotland. Um, and if you compare that to um, the number of tree species in European forests at the top, you'll see that, you know, it's very, very different. I mean, even 29%, um, you know, they have two to three species in the European forests. Um, and you'll see it split into forests which are undisturbed by man, semi-natural and plantations. Whereas, you know, in the UK, you'll see... Um, we, we don't have any forests undisturbed by man. I mean, you have to go to Latvia, Lithuania and Poland to see those areas. But we have a very small amount of semi-natural habitats remaining and the rest are plantations. So we are, we have got a lot of catching up to do in terms of restoration and really trying to um, get across the importance of why we need more diverse forests in, in the UK. I like this quotation that was given by um, a WWF representative um, some years ago, Jacques Blondel, um, 2008. And he makes this point, without mycorrhiza, there's no forest. Without pollination by insects, there's no seeds. Without seed dispersal, the renewal of the forest is slowed down. The simple fact is that adaptation to climatic change can only happen with the conservation of the very great genetic diversity of our trees. Um, you know, <laughs> to be honest, I could um, probably just start every single presentation I ever give with that with that quotation. Um, and anybody that's serious about forestry um, or, or growing trees or managing woodlands, um, you know, they should really have that in mind with everything that they do, um, because a forest is a living thing, as well as something that provides timber and firewood and a habitat for wildlife. Um, but without quite rightly, without any of those things, it's actually not actually a, a forest at all, in my opinion. So um, now we'll come on to growing trees. This is um, a couple of pictures of our tree nursery, which we've set up over the past 12 months it, outside our Aberdeen Reserve in Micehaven. Um, so it's very important to understand about UK and Ireland source and grown, uh, the UK ISG voluntary initiative that's run by the Woodland Trust, the forest nurseries. And there's 26 nurseries have qualified for UK ISG assured status, including some of the largest in the UK. And it identifies the provenance of stock to buyers and assures that trees have been raised from seed sourced and grown within the UK. Uh, it's something that um, we really should be asking for if anybody um, is embarking on a planting project and sourcing stock or even working with a nursery, we should really be doing our best to make sure that the stock we're buying is uh, UK and Ireland source and grown. So the trees that we're growing in our nursery are all certified UK and Ireland source and grown. And as we become a, a bigger, more productive nursery, we, we may well want to have that status for our own once we start giving stock out to other people. So, okay, presentation's getting a little bit more exciting now. <laughs> um, so I have to refer to Steve Watson, the tree shepherd, um, with, with the start of this section of the presentation. Um, so those that know me from um, about 2012 did quite a bit of work with Steve Watson, the tree shepherd, who's been a long-term advocate pioneer of no-fence tree planting methods. Johnny, before um, you go any further, sorry, can I just... Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian Bob Palmer's just got a, a question at the moment. Will the nursery survive after your project ends? Yeah, yes, it will. Yes, I'll talk about that again uh, later but yeah it, it will survive it's not going anywhere don't worry about that <laughs> real cheers um, okay um so this tree on the right this incredible oak tree uh, is what we what we would know colloquially as a saber tree um these trees have uh, they haven't been planted they've seeded by themselves and the only reason they've survived in a grazed landscape is because they're growing out at an angle and they've managed to escape the browsing pressure of sheep. Um, so a, a rowan on the left and an oak on the right. Um, I mean, that, that oak on the right is quite remarkable as it's growing out of a rock face. 
but they're, they're saber trees. And by learning from the way trees are able to survive in this way, um, Steve Watson has been a pioneer since the 70s and a big advocate of us learning about this type of agroforestry, if you want to call it agroforestry, about being able to plant trees in a way and think like a sheep where trees can actually be planted. And you'll find that most farmers that Steve has worked with and that we've been working with in Northeast Wales are more than happy to have trees planted where fences aren't required so that their livestock actually benefit from the shade and shelter of the tree. And also at the moment without them losing any single farm payment um, you know, for the time being. Here's a, an oak tree within some gorse that was planted in 2012. I took this photo last year. And as you can see, the gorse has, protect, has, has acted as a nurse for the oak and it's escaped browsing pressure. And that oak tree will now go on to live um, to maturity. Um, and then there's a holly on the left on a steep hillside planted at an angle perpendicular to the, the, the steep bank. And if you go there, it's above Dufferin Mumbia, you'll see shade, uh, lambs and sheep get benefiting from the, the shelter of that, that big holly tree. And the only reason it survived is because it's growing up like a hockey stick. And if, you, if you're able to think cleverly and identify these microsites, you can actually plant trees in this way and you should get good success rates. Here's another one of a farm outside Llandegla, uh, where we planted Scots pine within patches of gorse. So instead of clearing the gorse, which is obviously an important habitat anyway for wintering birds, using it as a nurse to protect planted trees. And the Scots pine is doing really well. The farmer's very happy with that. And here's some students from Shesvasi, Polycambria, assisting us with planting, uh, no fence planting, but planting trees as sabres in a little steep stream side um, in the Cluidian Hills. And this is what the um, stream side looks like in the summer. Um, got these lovely alder trees growing out at angles in the in little stream side. Um, this was probably wooded with alder uh, once upon a time. Um, but it's heavily grazed by sheep and we wouldn't want to exclude sheep uh, from it at all. I don't think the farmer would let us plant there and restore this habitat if we mentioned any fences. And there is an ecological reason why we're going to the lengths of identifying these little nants for planting. The ring oozel, red-listed bird species, only really passes through the Cluidian Hills uh, these days, um, but they do rely on nesting at the base of rocks and crevices under trees and particularly these little steep stream and nants, stream sides and nants, that's where they like to breed. So hopefully um, by the fact that we've restored about 300, 400 meters of this stream side with about three to 400 trees planted like this, over time, hopefully it will increase the breeding chances of ring oozel and I have actually seen ring oozel, recorded ring oozel, passing through this particular nant last year. But um, uh, I was getting a bit excited, but then we did go back um, months later to see if there was um, any activity and there's nothing to be seen. But we are keeping an eye on it as the habitat develops there. Um, so talking about water in trees on a presentation in Wales, you can't get away not mentioning the Pomp Bren project. Um, if you don't know about the Pomp Bren project, I, I do um, definitely recommend um, reading up as a, a report by the Woodland Trust have co-authored, which is available online and also the Coit Cymru website. Um, it's quite a famous project because it's farmer led. It was a group of farmers that looked at the catchment and had real problems with water and upland sheep farming location and realised where they could plant shelter belts, restore hedges. Um, and, and also create ponds to benefit the water across the catchment, uh, increase the infiltration rates and therefore graze the land um, at, at significant periods through the year, which they weren't able to do before. And investigations by scientists um, uh, recently have discovered that inside the woodland areas on one of the farms, water soaked into the soil 60 times quicker than in grassland pastures 10 metres away. So it is a pretty incredible project and it is, it's definitely inspired me. And I think lots of other people that are working with trees on farms in Wales. So here's an example of some of the work we do with volunteers on Parkland, building these two by two meter wooden tree cages. Um, we plant these with a standard tree in the middle 
and then three or four nurse species around, around that standard tree. So in this location, it will be sessile oak in the middle, using acorn source from the locality, and then group planted with field maple, hazel, hawthorn, even elder and holly um, to act as a nurse and create a little bit of a micro habitat and just an extra chance for stepping stones for wildlife to move through the landscape. And there's an example of one of the tree cages complete, ready to be planted in the next couple of months. Um, and we do quite a bit of hedgerow restoration. Um, the, the landscape area where we are, in, with, particularly within the Fluidian Hills, uh, it's very distinctive of these old cloud hedge banks, um, denuded of trees really. But there is a, a remnant um, mature witch elm there in the distance, which is quite unusual that it survived Dutch elm disease, but it's geographically isolated on its own on top of a hill. So we have taken seed to the nursery with the hope that it, um, you know, we might be able to propagate it um, and use it, and particularly in enrichment planting in woodlands. But um, this is a hedge that's been planted with mixed broadleaves, so mostly hawthorn, and then the rest with hazel, holly, field maple, uh, crab apple, and double fenced. And then on the right, a stream side planted with riparian trees, so particularly aspen, alder, crack willow, osier, common osier. Um, we're a big, big fan of aspen. Um, on the Woodlands for Water project, very resilient tree, and I think it's going to be an important tree for the future, particularly in the face of pests and diseases and climate change. Um, so this is, we paid for the double fencing. It's a very compacted site with horses, uh, where we funded a, a soil aerator to increase the infiltration on the fields. And then hopefully um, these trees will stabilize some of that erosion of this stream side, uh, because using, using a, a Durham University mapping software called SIMAP, this particular stream scores red in terms of accumulated flood risk. So SIMAP is a really good, useful tool to identify water courses that are in desperate need of intervention. Uh, some more volunteers planting a new hedgerow um, where we've, we've had to fence it off from the sheep, but it's a, a community food growing cooperative. It's been set up in Grey and Rid, uh, Rid Talog, in between Mould and Lees, um, Mould and uh, Sandegla. Uh, very high up, very exposed, but uh, the landowner here is diversifying into sheep breeding, is very keen on shelter, shade and shelter for her livestock. So um, yeah, lots of uh, tree planting and hedgerow planting um, to be done there. Um, we do quite a bit of um, woodland carbon planting on some farms. Some of the farmers are keen, that we work with are keen on creating woodlands, but then they're particularly interested in the woodland carbon um, incentives they can get through the woodland carbon code, where you, check, you, you trade the units every five years. So, so this is an example of a woodland carbon project. Um, so we, we provide the fencing and the planting, and this is a labour provided by a corporate work party from Siemens. Some of the engineers that work on the wind farm came out to help us restore this, this little nant. Um, and I'll just explain that this project links up two fragmented wooded habitats further down the valley here and one behind us that you can't see. So it is, it's actually a very successful um, planting project in terms of connecting up remnant ancient woodland habitats, but also the farmer is utilising some unproductive ground and also getting to um, the potential that his son will be able to trade the carbon every five years. Um, and I also do want to mention about tree species with the highest potential for carbon. Um, because there's a lot of um, what I would say greenwashing going on with the forest industry with woodland carbon at the moment and um, the, the people really need to do their research on the species that sequester the most carbon. Um, so the University of Guelph in Canada, um, there's a fantastic video on YouTube that looks at trees where they've spent a lot of time and research into working out the best trees, the trees that sequester the most carbon, particularly in agricultural systems. And as you can see, the top three species that outweigh the conifers that were tested are hybrid poplar, red oak and black walnut. Um, and I know for, for certain that a lot of the woodland carbon plantings I've seen on my travels do not have poplar, oak or walnut in. Um, the one scary species I'm seeing a lot of is eucalyptus, which I absolutely wouldn't plant on my land because it releases a toxin and it's the worst thing for the soil. 
But hybrid poplar, if you look at the study from the University of Guelph, um, it outperforms everything. Its yield in terms of carbon sequestration, that's above ground or below ground, is just mind blowing um, in terms of the other, other species they compared it to. So if we're serious about sequestering carbon, we should be planting poplar. Here's a, um, a, a riparian coppice planting on a farm uh, in Kilkin in the Cluidian Hills, linking up two fragmented wooded habitats. We fenced off the stream on the left hand side of the stream is a wooded stream um, which has been poached because of the cattle getting to the to the watercourse. So we fenced that off and we've also fenced off this remnant ancient woodland um, which was previously used for pheasant rearing. Pheasants have been excluded. We've been able to fence it off as also quite a significant badger set in there. And then we've linked up the two woods and planted a fast growing coppice. This particular farmer has got diversifying um, into glamping, uh, ecotourism, and he's looking to provide more, more use of firewood on the farm. So this is fast growing uh, riparian coppice that he'll be able to coppice and utilize sustainably for coppice. And all this, this field is a very, very wet area. Um, there's a number of springs just further upstream from here. Um, in the winter, it, uh, before we agreed to do this work, we had to decide what type of fencing we would use. These are plastic fence posts with metal strainers um, to make sure that these trees survive and really do their function to try and hopefully lower the water table um, and perform properly. On that, it, it, Johnny, sorry, can I jump in? Uh, yeah, yeah. What, one of the questions are, uh, do we um, do we only use protect the, you know, the um, plastic tree protectors? Because are, are there alternatives you can use as well? Yeah, good question. Um, that's true. So these, we have put, uh, there are hairs on this site. So this, this site is quite good for brown hair, which I'm ha happy to see, um, but um, not good for trees. So yeah, we have had to put the protection in. But so once the trees have grown beyond the plastic tree shelters, then they'll be safe against hares, because um, hares are a woodland species anyway. But um, you're quite right. And the problem with tree guards is they can't be recycled. Um, there's a component that doesn't allow them to be recycled properly. Um, and I know the Woodland Trust is, are spending a lot of time researching the alternatives for them to last a long time. And obviously with tree guards, they need to be in place for two or three years to enable, I mean, when you plant a tree, you need to be doing some weed suppression, ideally, but most people don't. So therefore, if you go for a bigger tree shelter, it enables that tree. Um, it also gives the tree some microclimate and allows the tree to outcompete the tall growing grasses. Um, but it is a problem. Um, if you're not going to use, uh, there are biodegradable tree guards, but again, it's questionable how effective they are beyond 18 months to two years. They do start, start to disintegrate. Um, and they're, very, they're quite expensive. They're more expensive than standard tree guards. Um, we have planted a hedge recently where we've done without guards altogether, just as a trial to see, we, we planted more trees. So as a safe, we know we're gonna lose some, probably to voles and rabbits, but by planting more trees, we're, we're just gonna accept that loss for the fact that we don't wanna go back and collect all that plastic in the future. Um, so yeah, I think it's an issue to keep uh, on. I think it sounds like we're still not there with the technology um, and particularly the fact they can't be recycled. Um, but hopefully um, it's something to keep an eye on because there are alternatives. I think they're just trying to perfect the durability of them. Um, you can use wool in the Lake District. I mean, we don't have deer luckily in this part of North East Wales, but in the Lake District, they put little bundles of wool on the leading shoot of their trees and that deters nibbling by animals. That's quite a nice, unique method. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, I think that does make sure that. Okay. Uh, so there, there's um, a higher up image of this particular site. You can see the fenced off woodland on the left, and then the connected wood planting that we planted here, and then the fenced off wooded stream with a uh, has a path that we've had to put in a new kissing gate here. Um, so quite a nice project on a farm linking up wooded habitats and providing productive timber for the farmer. Um, here's a, a longer image of the previous carbon planting scheme. You can see there's remnants of ancient woodland here and here. And this is the woodland carbon planting. It's basically putting woodland back once where it was. Because on the tithe map, the tithe map's very interesting. 
uh, in Wales, we can access the tide map through Places Wales website. They've digitized the tide map so we can access that for free. And this was wooded, wooded in 1845, 1849. Uh, but the farmer already knew that. I didn't need to show him that. And he was more than happy for us to um, plant that up, especially as he's, he'd be able to get some carbon um, trading from it as well. There's another image of the planting of a planting site. Um, okay, so away from uh, planting now, I'm going to go on to hedges. Um, we've been a big advocate at North Wales Wildlife Trust for some years on living landscapes, promoting sustainable management of hedges. I'm just going to play this video. Um, so in Aylesbury, Aylesbury Vale Countryside Service, um, they only give grants to landowners for managing the hedges using this method of mechanical hedge laying, which they call wildlife hedge laying. And it allows you to lay basically a hedge as big as you want. You do need access to a tractor or here a 360 uh, with a grab. Um, and you need to be pretty handy with a chainsaw. But in Aylesbury, they can lay 800 metres of hedge in a day for £1,500. And they call it wildlife hedge laying because there's so many papers that have been published on it and they're so convinced by the method. The hedge retains all its flowers, all its fruit in the first year. You haven't got to deal with all the brash and burning in the field. And then obviously with a lot of regrowth of nettles in the field afterwards. And you're losing all that wildlife habitat. By laying your hedges mechanically, the hedge retains its value and also gives shade and shelter and protection for livestock in the field. So that's an example. You can see the people ready to start laying the hedge. Just then you can see the size of the hedge that we're dealing with. This is a dairy farm. And here's a drone, some drone footage of the hedge three months later when it's been laid and double fenced. And as you can see, it looks like a hurricane's gone through it. <laughs> but in the second and third years that hedge grows, you wouldn't know the difference. So it's created immediate wildlife habitat, immediate shade and shelter for the cows. And, um, and, it's, uh, and, it, and it, we did that within six hours with a 360 and five people on chainsaws. We also put in a pond in this hedge. If, if there's a place for a pond in a hedge, I always try and include pond restoration or pond creation um, within the corridor. So there you can see it's a pretty mammoth hedge. In my opinion, much better than those flailed monstrosities in the background. So yeah, so there's, there's an example of one. I think I've got another one here. There's a photograph of it in Blossom, looking down, pretty impressive, full of wildlife. Um, there are actually birds diving into it as we were laying it. I mean, if you saw a, somebody with an axe and a billhook doing that with birds, I don't think you'd, think you'd ever see that. Um, here's a hedge that was laid in Wrexham in 2016, very successful, that was basically just a stand of degraded trees that were being eaten out by sheep. Uh, that, pretty much wasn't a hedge and was on its way to just being lost completely. So by laying that hedge, we've been able to put it back. And, and the guys from Aylesbury laid that hedge about 250 metres in four hours. And here's a video of us laying, oh, a bit loud, laying, laying a big hawthorn. So you put your picture in, quite careful, 70, you wouldn't go any more than 70%. Through the um, through the stem, turn that down a little bit. Use a bit wide. <laughs> so yeah, you only bleach seventy percent through the stem, and you can see the size of the bleacher that comes out. And you also take a little bit off the leading side as well to stop it snapping. And then using a a digger with a grab, you should be able to gently push it over. cheer in the background it's still attached 
so um yeah it's it it's um it's only for certain places i mean this particular hedge was very old on the edge of a woodland um but if a chipping company had approached this farmer as the driving through particularly through i'm shocked to see uh, you know the practice of chip rubbing out chipping hedgerows because of the demand for chip particularly in mid and south wales i'm horrified at the fact that this practice is um is even supported by agri-environment schemes we should really be um any big old hedges we, we are able to lay them because they do it in aylesbury and they have been for 20 years so you know if a chipping company had seen this would offer the farmer a check for the chip but he's this particular farmer uh, is very wildlife minded and was more interested in shade and shelter for his livestock and improving the, the wildlife value of the wood um so it's just an example of what can be done with an over mature hedgerow and on that note i've got another question for you johnny okay do you get um are farmers more aware of the importance of trees and hedgerows for the environment and are they asking you to plant these areas more than they used to yes i would say they are actually um i mean i think yeah it's uh, they're definitely aware of carbon because obviously they're being given information on carbon from all directions farming connect till hill uh, probably even the farming unions um because there's a lot of investment incentives to planting trees um but which is great but i think we have to be important from a conservation point of view the role of the wildlife trust i think and the role of ngos is to make sure that um wooded habitats are sustainable and managed sustainably and we're not just planting squirrel food i think we are guilty conservation sector of giving trees away to plant squirrel food that is the last thing we should be doing and the last thing we should be advocating with farmers we should be demonstrating the importance of trees on farms and why farming and forestry are integrated and always were and still are in france switzerland denmark norway most across europe um so yeah it's great that we have some you know advantages to, for farmers um and there are you know ways to encourage farmers to plant but you know there's, there's a lot of things that we need to keep in mind the right tree in the right place planting mixtures um and just having that information to equip farmers with really and I, I don't think that that information is necessarily um out there and available or uh but because it's about trying to inform and educate farmers about forestry which they traditionally weren't trained in but the, the next generation of farmers that come particularly from harper adams and rec that um, i i do find the next generation of farmers to be more clued up about the use of trees on farms so um, maybe the next generation of farmers um, might be more clued up and, and keen and keen. Uh, I, do def I definitely do see that, but I do think the en environmental NGO sector should, um, you know, we, we, we should be making sure that our voice is, is heard and we give making sure the right information is disseminated. Um, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I've just quickly got one more question then about hedges. So is it the den denser, so Caroline asks, is it the denser vegetation at ground level that's hedge laying so good for wildlife? Yeah, so, <clears throat> uh, well, if we're talking about traditional hedge laying, you're talking to the wrong man, because I don't think traditional hedge laying is good for wildlife at all, because it, it takes out, you're taking out 80% of the vegetation and the hedge is not going to flower and fruit in its first year. Um, so it will eventually, but, you know, it's, it's quite expensive quite destructive and there isn't much left but it looks fantastic and i do think there's a, a place and simon a place for traditional hedge laying absolutely it's a tra traditional raw skill and it looks fantastic but 95 percent of the hedges i see on farms are not suitable for traditional hedge laying and they're not publicly visible and they're certainly not going to pay somebody with a bill hook and an axe to go and lay it and certainly not 1500 pounds for 800 meters so um yeah I, I do think there's a problem because the other alternative is it will just be coppice but yeah it should be broad a hedge for wildlife should be broad at the base um and should form a, an a it should really grow into an a shape and in, if you ever go to aylesbury and see the hedges there they're very broad at the base with a grassy margin so if you do have the budget to pay for double fencing your hedge then it allows that rough grassland strip to develop either side of the hedge which is great for voles and obviously hunt it, then hunting area for barn owl 
and then flowering plants, those field margin plants, um, where arable weeds might be able to grow, like you know, corn cockle, uh, corn marigold, even yarrow um, on those edges of, of hedgerows. So having that strip of grassland either side of the hedge very important for wildlife, but trying to get those hedges to grow broad and tall and that sort of A shape. But you know, the only way you're really going to get that is by putting those hedges back into management and you know if you can <laughs> trying to do some more mechanical hedge laying. Yes, mate. Any more questions? Not at the moment. No, we're all good. Okay. Uh, okay, right. We'll go on to uh, the management of trees on rivers now. Um, so through the Woodlands for Water project, we're lucky to have the budget to be able to pay um, to have trees pollarded. And there's a, a fantastic case study from the River Clun in Shropshire, the AOMB um, in Shropshire, Shropshire Hills AOMB, where they have demonstrated pollarding a third of riverside trees has had massive benefits for wildlife and for the riverbank. So this photograph was taken of the River Allen, where it meets the Dee, um, not far from Rosset. And you can see the huge erosion that has come into the field. This is about 40, 50 metres into the field. There was an alder tree here some years ago, only about seven or eight years ago. It got really mature, as these ones are. And as these big mature alders do, they're susceptible to Phytophthora. Um, and they become to such an age, they blow over and their roots rip the riverbank out with them. And because this river has been channelized in the past, the energy of this river is just scouring the, uh, the riverbed. And the energy of that river is, um, is pretty incredible. So it will take out anything that falls in its path. Um, but traditionally, riverside trees were pollarded or coppiced, either for charcoal, alder is the best charcoal wood, or for making flog wood. And obviously that management has stopped since the war. Nobody has really been bothered about managing riverside trees. But this section of river I identified with the farmer is very upset about the state of his riverbanks and the fact that he's having these massive areas of erosion, quite rightly. So I was more than happy to look at funding a contractor in with a tree shear to pollard above great, because the, these fields are all raised with cattle. So the coppicing would be no good because the animals would browse the regrowth from the stump. They have to be pollarded above head height. You know, we're talking over six foot, but only a third. And if I just skip to the next video, you'll see this is the river. Here's the farm on the right. It's an organic beef farm. And here's the river. And you can see a lot of the riverbank is wooded, but that's natural for a river. You would never expect a, a, a river to be completely wooded. Um, partial shade is the best for wildlife, particularly for freshwater fish and for nurseries for fish. Partial shade is best. Um, but obviously, these, get, these trees are becoming over mature. It's getting to the point where there's not going to be any trees left if they're not managed. So every time you coppice or pollard a tree, we're, we're doing it because its tree roots grow, they respond. So every time you cut, cut, cut a tree, its roots will do that. And on a river bank, that is the best thing you could ever you could ever want, is for those tree roots to grow and stabilize the river bank to prevent further erosion into the river. Um, so very simple and cost-effective way, if you, if you know a contractor with a tree shear, very dangerous to do by yourself, it's possible with a tree surgeon, but doing it at scale, you really need um, a digger with a, a tree shear and a machine. Um, so here's the same river bank afterwards. Um, so you'll see the timber, only a third of those, of the, if you measure from A to B, the whole length of the river bank, only a third of those trees have been pollarded. And then in another five years time, we'll pollard another third. But all of that material has been utilized for either firewood, because the farmer actually has a subsidiary business selling firewood, but also utilization for wood chip. And wood chip, rainmill wood chip has been shown to be very, very beneficial for the soil. If you use it as bedding, your cows, and then pile it on the yard with a tarp, let it break down. Within six weeks, you can spread it over the land as rainmill wood chip, and it's probably the best soil improver you'll ever find. 
but it has to be white wood chip. So alder, aspen, birch, willow. And there's a very good book on the subject coming out soon by the Soilist, by Ben Raskin of the Soil Association. And we're hoping to invite him up next year to give a farm walk on using rain mill wood chip. You could, uh, having a machine using the pollarded material, you can actually drive this big material into the riverbank. And if I just sc scroll back a little bit, you'll see just here. There we go. So just by here, and here, this material is big. We're talking 30 centimetres, 40 centimetres in diameter, but using the, the digger, he was able to drive that well into the riverbank. And now it's grown into a new area of older, well, we would call it older car habitat, a biodiversity action plan habitat in Wales. But it's prevented the further erosion of this riverbank by planting crack golden time to use crack willow on riverbanks. And that's all growing back into new trees and stabilizing that riverbank uh, for the future. Uh, okay, and um, so this is why we do it. This is coppicing in Shropshire on the left. And this is this is the same location one year later. So, you know, you can see the riverbank immediately after coppicing and fencing shows poor bankside habitat from excess shading and uncontrolled stock access. And then there's the same location one year later. It shows vigorous coppice regrowth on a healthy bankside vegetation. And this contributes to the water framework directive because it improves water quality, prevents riverbank erosion. And you can see in the background, that's all decent firewood for the farmer. And obviously, alder and willow will just keep growing, so it's a sustainable supply of wood chip or firewood for the farm. And this is another reason why we do it. So these are um, hoverflies um, that have been recorded by Brian Formstone, um, an active member of North Wales Wildlife Trust and an excellent entomologist. Um, and he he spends a lot of time recording hoverflies. Here are two Pacata personata, rare hoverflies associated with over mature and dead beech trees. Brian found that at Worthenbury, arguably the most impressive bumblebee mimic that is actually a hoverfly. And then this one, Calcasiris onotus, another rare hoverfly. Um, and it's associated with semi submerged logs. It lays its eggs in the curled bark on submerged, particularly birch logs on the edges of rivers. And you can see here down the bottom right hand corner, the location of where it would lay its eggs, the oviposition. position. There's two obby position areas on this birch log on the edge of this river. And Brian recorded that's a red listed hoverfly recorded at Irvig a couple of times he's recorded that. So this is why dead wood in rivers and just pollarding a third is so important for wildlife. Uh, you okay, Mark? Any more questions or should I carry on? <laughs> no, you're all right. Carry on. Yeah, what time is it now? <laughs> I don't know what time it is. Anyway, okay, carry on. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so I'll go on to woodland management now. Um, so our focus primarily on woodlands is ancient woodlands um, because it's such a threatened habitat in Britain. As I mentioned on the, the first, very first slide about the extent of semi-natural habitats, semi-natural wooded habitats in Britain. So just a quick, I'm sure a lot of people know about ancient woodlands, but I'll just recap about some um, what they are. So they've been in a continuous existence since before 1600 in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. That's what's classed as an ancient woodland. Um, and it's used to describe semi-natural stands on ancient woodland sites. And the, the precise definition is different depending on circumstances and different, particularly within different counties within the UK. So particularly around Durham, County Durham is quite different to ancient woodland classifications that we have on the west coast of Wales, for example. Um, and and it, an ancient woodland site can refer to a site of ancient woodland irrespective of its current tree cover. A lot of people are quite surprised by that. Um, and I'll, I'll just show a slide of ghost woodland in a minute, what we mean by you know, ghost woodland. And where the native tree cover has been felled and replaced by planting of um, trees that aren't native to the area, we call that a pause, a plantation on an ancient woodland site. And a pause could be planted with conifers, beech trees, or even invasive species like rhododendron. That's what you would call a pause. And you can see here, you've got a high quality native habitat. So ancient semi-natural woodland, these are the gold, these are the ones that we absolutely want protecting and turning into nature reserves if we can. Um, and then we have wood pasture, montane woodland, which is mainly restricted to the Cairngorms in Scotland. 
And then we've got high potential native woodland sites. So these are ones that are degraded. So we've got pores. So we've got non-site native pores. So things like beech and, and conifers, invasive species pores, that's rhododendron. And then this old definition we don't really use anymore. So when the native trees have been removed, we classify it as a restored pores. And then we also have this category here, conservation value secondary woodland. So where an area has been cleared, and it's just allowed to regenerate by itself, particularly urban sites or quarries or mines, um, you know, sl slopes of quarries, they're the kind of areas where secondary woodland will grow and they do have an important wildlife um, benefit. And then we have this other category, ghost or derelict woodland, which is classed as areas that have got sub 20% forest cover. And here's just an example of um, high quality native woodland habitats. So we've got a good example of wood pasture, I think this is in Cumbria. Here's an ancient semi-natural woodland here in North East Wales. And here's the, an example of montane Scots pine wood colored earth. And then here we are on high potential native woodland sites. So this is what we mean by a ghost woodland. You can see bluebells are quite bullish, but you will see bluebells on other ancient woodland indicator plants, even though there's no trees there. But if you look on the old maps, sure enough, you'll probably find that that was once wooded. And we call that a ghost woodland. Here's the pause, so you can see the difference. It was all ancient woodland, but this area was planted with larch and sick spruce. And this area has had the spruce rem removed and some of the native broadleaves are unable to go through along with all the ancient woodland plants that have got enough light to be able to grow. And this is what you would class as a secondary woodland that's just grown by itself. Things like ash and sycamore have pioneered into there. Um, so it, it's important that we know what the threats are to ancient woodland. Um, so if we want to manage them and allow them to recover, we need to identify those threats um, and put in measures to control them. Otherwise, we're not really going to be able to uh, manage it sustainably in the long term. So here we are. A, a, a poor site, ancient woodlands like planted with conifers. Um, and I'll talk about CCF in a minute, but this is about graduated density thinning. So instead of clear felling conifers, gradually letting the light in by putting in racks at spacings, usually of one in eight. And here's an, an inv invasive species, as you, as you know, rhododendron, um, really bad for the ground floor. It doesn't really let anything else grow and very toxic for the soil. So important to identify and control that. Um, and then obviously wildlife can be a problem. So deer species and gray squirrel. Um, if we don't, if we're not able to control gray squirrel or deer, then we haven't really got much of a chance of growing a healthy uh, woodland ecosystem. Um, and then onto clear fell. Um, and clear fell is pretty disastrous for ancient woodland. Um, I have got, I think I've got reference to a paper on the next slide, but you can see the machinery here. This digger hasn't stayed on the rack. Um, you know, you would absolutely never put a machine and damp compact and damage the soil. Potentially that soil will now be damaged forever and it will never recover because of the compaction of that machine. This machine should never have gone off this track. Um, the, the, the timber should have been winched onto the track into an area or they should have found a way of using a horse or motor manual to get that timber off without damaging the soil. Here's the paper. So this is a paper by Brown, Curtis and Adams. And there are lots of studies that have shown about the detrimental effects of patch clear felling now. This is just one about uh, the effects of clear felling versus gradual removal of conifers, particularly to do with management of light levels. And this paper has shown um, that when you're restoring an ancient woodland site, you should be doing it gradually. Um, and here's a pretty horrific image of a clear fell site um, down in South Wales. But the Woodlands for Water, Woodlands for Wales policy document in 2000, it proposed a major shift in the management of Welsh forests. And it said that 50% of the Forestry Commission estate in Wales had to be converted to continuous cover forest management over a 20 year period. That hasn't happened. We're probably lucky if 5% follow close to nature forestry. But it's complicated even further with the choice of a new term called low impact silvicultural systems, which complicates what CCF is all about even further. So I'm going to go on to continuous cover forestry. A lot of the woodlands that we work with, particularly most woodlands in Wales, are owned by farmers. They're very small. This is an ancient woodland site planted with beech and larch. And, um, you know, probably, you know, nine out of ten 
woodlands in Wales are like this, very small on steep hillsides and usually planted with exotic conifers. But this farmer didn't see the logic in clear felling it. He could quite easily go and approach a company down the road that would take the timber and chip it and clear fell the site. And that goes on um, quite a lot, as I'm sure you might have seen. But it doesn't make economic sense to manage a woodland. And if you go to France or Switzerland, it doesn't make sense to do that, mainly because you're capitalising on the trees all in one go. And then you're having to deal with the replanting costs and managing the massive invasion of bramble, bracken, rose bay willow herb, loads of weed management. Um, you'll be very, very lucky to be able to get trees growing once you clear fell that site. You'll, have to, you'll be spending a lot of money and, and as well as controlling wildlife. It's much better to learn about continuous cover forestry and particularly single tree selection. So here's a forest up at Wyford Woods up in Cumbria. Um, and this is an example of a woodland being moved into CCF. So we don't have any woodlands at equilibrium in, in Britain. As it, the first slide I showed you where Latvia and Lithuania and Poland, where they've got um, primeval forests, they're woodlands that are regulating themselves. Um, and they're basically, they're at the mercy of wind blow and lightning. And the only time regeneration happens is when a gap appears within the canopy. But this is a managed forestry commission site at Cumbria and individual trees are selected for harvest each management intervention and the gaps create opportunities for natural regeneration to become established. And through time, the forest becomes increasingly diverse while at the same time yielding improved and high quality timbers produced. So it's all about taking out what you need at the time, finding a market for it and growing big quality timber and regulating light to allow different age classes and species to, to regenerate under the canopy. And I go on, here we go. So here, here, here is why continuous cover forestry is such, um, it's something that we should really be promoting um, in Wales. It's, it's resilient, it allows forests to become more resilient in the face of a changing climate and pests and diseases, because you're moving a forest into a forest that's made, as I, as I mentioned, is made up of different age classes and different species. Um, and as it becomes more resilient, it's more, more less prone to, to wind blow. Um, they're economically productive. So this is the timber out of one intervention. So you're, inter you're intervening in a conversion every five or six years. And there's the timber that's come out of one intervention. So you, you are getting an income from it. It's socially responsible because it's not going to the mercy of big forestry companies. It's actually supporting local timber markets and local timber users. Um, so it, it does make sure that the, the, the value and the economy of the timber remains in the local area. And of course, we're not destroying a wooded habitat. So therefore the wildlife is able to move and take up new niches um, and the ecotones that are created in between the woodlands. Um, whether they're managed, for, if, if a glade is put in, if there's a group of trees that are taken out, a glade's created, and obviously lots of wildlife will benefit and make use of that glade, including pied flycatchers, which is a key species of, of the woodlands in our area. Um, and as I said, it doesn't make any, it, it, it makes economic sense really to manage your forest following continuous cover forest practice. Um, and th this gives you an example um, so this price diameter curve shows you um, if you harvest your trees at a certain time, you're actually harvesting, you're actually nipping the coupon and allowing the trees to grow and harvest them when they reach, when they reach their target diameter. We don't really have a tradition anymore in this country of learning when trees have reached their target diameter. And CCF is all about growing big, big timber and a mixture of forests are allowed to grow into big timber and just taking out that when you need it. And you only harvest trees when they reach their target diameter. And as you can see, this is an example based on the forest productivity of, of a mixed age forest compared to a single age forest. And this was the chap um, who I never got to meet, Talis Kalnars, who worked um, in Wales and managed private woodland estates in North Wales. Uh, he was a Latvian and a big pioneer of continuous cover forestry. And in Talis's system, the implement, implementation of woodland management is relatively simple. 
the forest through every felling cycle, three to five years, decide which trees to fell and extract, and the following points determine which trees to fell. So every extraction must be profitable. He's, he always said to find markets before you fell. Extract no more than 20% of the standing volume. Extract no more than the increment as measured since last intervention. So the increment is the amount of growing in the tree. So you'll measure a tree now, and then you'll do some work in five years and you'll measure how the tree, the volume has increased. And that's the timber increment of the stand. And you don't expose, don't overexpose any part of the woodland. So that's basically making sure that the, the forest has the ability to overstack, to withstand any wind blow. Fell up to 60% of high profit target diameter trees as dictated by the market. He says to fell the dominant species first, retain the best quality trees as seed sources for later felling. And he said not to, to don't waste any time with thinning or respacing and to try and release successful advanced regeneration of desired suitable species. Um, and that's amazing if we're able to do that, particularly on, a, on a, a small farm woodland. But there are situations in Wales that have been planted by monocultures of conifers where we do have to do follow some practice of thinning to convert them to continuous cover. And we've entered into a memorandum of understanding with Natural Resources Wales at Coidmore Vamai on a 12 hectare Sitka spruce plantation that was planted in 1996 that would have been clear felled um, but it would have been a bit of a disaster for sedimentation of the River Allen, which is less than a kilometre um, down the catchment from here. So NRW uh, and ourselves have set up a demonstration stand to convert this um, Sitka spruce stand into continuous cover forestry following graduated density thinning and single tree selection. And there's actually now a training stand, what's called a Martelloscope, set up within half a hectare of this stand. And this year we had two cohorts of Bangor forestry students come and learn about selection and marking trees. And um, marking is a bit of a dying art these days in forestry in this country, unfortunately. But the Martelloscope training exercise allows students or anyone, even farmers, to learn about selecting trees um, and learning about thinning interventions to move that monoculture conifer plantation into something that's more diverse and resilient for the future. We have done a bit of work on ancient woodland sites. This is a beech plantation, um, very dark, very shady, typical of beech with a canopy clo closing over, doesn't really let much else grow underneath it really, so in desperate need of intervention. So we managed to fund some small glade creation um, using horse loggers. Horse, log horse logging is very good, mainly because it's minimal impaction. So, you know, machinery is more likely to compact the soil and has detrimental impacts on the ancient woodland flora that we want to come back. But it also, the impact of the hooves and the skidding of the logs, skidding the ground on a woodland is very beneficial in a woodland because it pushes the seed in contact with the soil and exposes that soil to the light. And obviously using horses with logs, it actually breaks up the ground in quite a beneficial way. But this area will not be touched now because it's been, it's been, it's been cleared. It's a, there's a glade been created of about 15, 20 trees, and it's been replanted with mixed broad leaves. Um, and here's, the, here's another horse logger on the same site being trained to take on, on a different, on a different um, wood, wood compartment in the woodland. Um, you can see skidding the log out. And here's an example of the glade afterwards. And there's some of the timber, 12 foot beech lengths that have come out. And here's an image afterwards of how that site has responded um, to fur. So we have broad buckler fern, male fern, hard fern, wood anemone and bluebell all coming through just just down to the fact that that area has been released the light has been allowed to reach the woodland floor and some of that um, dense beech litter has been broken up by the by the horse lovers and that's the end of the presentation so i'm happy to take any questions that anyone has i think i've only got one at the moment um only one. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, we got through them during the tour, didn't we? Lynn, I've actually, I've, I've actually got a video. If any, if you'd like me to, I was actually going to finish with a, a an interesting video that's inspired me and what's actually possible. So it's a ten minute video. Um, I'll take some questions and then I'll decide if anybody wants to see this ten minute video on a restoration project in China, which is very inspirational. Well, the only question I've got now is Lynn's asking, are we going to be doing any further clearance with horses? Uh, yes, so on the uh, farm woodland I showed, um, that will be thinned using horse loggers because it's a very steep slope. And we've got one person saying they want to see the video, so... Um, before, okay. So before we go on to the video, let's just... Uh, Nigel, Sue, have you got, either of you got anything you'd like to add or ask at this point? Right. Am I muted now? I can hear you now, Sue. Oh, right, sorry. Um, well, that was great, actually. Um, I'm glad you're videoing it because I'll have to recap this. Um, thank you. I think, I think people who don't want to see the video can, can leave at this point. Um, but, but I'm sure a lot of people are very keen. I've certainly learned so much from this interesting talk. Um, and I'll, I'm going to look at it again. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you. I, I, um, that's great. Carry on with the video. I'd, okay. I'd echo if got, Sue. If you've got time, if you've got time. <clears throat> Mark, I'd echo Sue's comments. And it's great to see science underpinning good woodland management at various scales, from small scale to large scale, and where biodiversity counts as much as anything for the value of a forest. Um, it seems to me the right way around. Uh, good for everybody and certainly good for the planet. So um, well done to everybody concerned. Very heartening. And that final image, I think, says it all. Well, we've still got 54 participants still on, Johnny. So if you want to play the video. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was just going to finish with this um, amazing video on a restoration of the Lust Plateau in China. Um, it inspired me um, when I worked at um, IUCN. Um, and heard about the scale of forest restoration in China. The Lost Plateau is the size of France in northwest China, but the restoration area is 33,000 hectares. Um, and it, if that's a comparison of Wales, Wales in area is just over 20,000 um, kilom 20, kilometres in, in, in hectares. So it gives you an idea, it's 33,000. So it's almost one and a half times the size of Wales in terms of restoration. Um, but it's a 10 minute video and I'll show you um, what is actually possible in terms of restoring, using trees to restore um, ecosystems at a, at a catchment scale. So I'll see if I can, um, I'm just gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna reshare this video, so I'll stop sharing. Um, and I'm gonna share this one. Optimize. So I hope you'll be able to hear this. That we're finding ways to help nature. We can see the potential to restore. Can you see and hear that, Mark? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay, right. Enjoy. Now that we're finding ways to help nature we can see the potential to restore the earth. Much of central China once looked like this. But there are places where 8,000 years of human activity had stripped the land bare. is little short of a miracle. John Liu has followed it for over 25 years. Coming out to the Lis Plateau has completely changed my perspective on life. There's no difference between the interests of human beings and the interests of nature. In 1994, John was sent to cover the biggest story of his career. 
I'd been a journalist in China for about 15 years, and then the World Bank asked me to go out to the Luce Plateau. Well, the Luce Plateau is 640,000 square kilometers, approximately the size of France, but it's also the cradle of Chinese civilization because all the cultures were growing up around the Yellow River because it's very, very fertile. The soil type is loose, and it's a wind-borne sediment. It's very minerally rich, but because it's so powdery, if you remove the vegetation and you expose it to the wind and to the rain, you get a completely different result. Essentially, when it rained, without any vegetation, all of that water would run off and it would take the topsoils. And so that's what makes the Yellow River the Yellow River. And so over thousands of years, it became the most eroded place on Earth. The Luce Plateau was contributing 1.6 billion tons of silt into the river every year. This made it prone to flash floods. Over the last 150 years, it has claimed 7 million lives, earning it the name China's Sorrow. We had images of the place without any vegetation. This is the scale of it. The, the scale was just astonishing. You couldn't believe that this was happening. I mean, the whole place was denuded of vegetation. There was just nothing there. We saw that the sheep and goats were just denuding everything. I mean, if anything stuck its head up, it was food. The area was in ecologic collapse, and the reason was human activity. The lowest soil is so fine it would take to the wind, causing severe respiratory symptoms, and send dust storms as far as Beijing. You know, the situation was so grim. The repeated cycle of flooding, then followed by drought and followed by famine. the Chinese government said we have to do something here. And when I went out there and I saw a place that looked like the moon, I was just fascinated. So enormous, and really nobody knew anything about it. You know, when you look at an area which is that massively degraded, it's not your first thought that, well, that's fine, we can just fix that. In the 1980s, around 85 million people were living in the lowest plateau, putting enormous pressure on the land. When the experts came through and started to analyze what was going on, they said, well, in order to change it, we have to basically change the behaviors of all the people. Essentially, all their behaviors were banned. So they were unable to cut trees. They were unable to farm on the slopes. And then free ranging of goats and sheep was made illegal. The people had to be part of the solution. So what they did was they paid the people to redevelop the landscape. In 1994, work began in earnest on one of the biggest land rehabilitation projects ever attempted. The hills were terraced to slow the flow of water allowing it to soak into the soil. 
The scale of this was just unbelievable. When you when you went out there and you saw that they were using just hand tools or simple machinery, and that they were doing this over vast areas. And of course, revegetation was a big part of it. The top had to be trees and had to be totally vegetated, totally reforested. John has documented the results ever since. I put my tripod here and looked out at these areas back in 1995. Well, this is a change. This is amazing. If you can take a place that has been destroyed over thousands of years and bring it back to life, this is pretty astonishing. It took a long time to degrade, but actually the restoration is going much faster. Now you can see in 25 years, it's completely different. And this is done by ordinary people. This is huge. This is the way forward. In just a generation, the land has returned to health. The fertile soil is now stable, and the water is retained in the earth and the plants. Now we feel the relative humidity. We see the mist in the air. And so that's very important for increased productivity. More plants mean more insects, attracting more birds, which spread new seeds, increasing the plant life further in a natural cycle of recovery. When we see a stream which is flowing clear as this is, then it's an indicator of ecological health. Without all this vegetation without organic soil, you'd be taking the sediments in here and it would be cloudy. Amphibians are a really good indicator of ecologic health. And healthy nature benefits everyone. The people who still live in these communities now have a much better quality of life. Humans are part of nature, and we need to change the intention of human civilization to restoring ecological function on a planetary scale. If we do this, we're ensuring the quality of life for future generations. I'm happy to see that they're in another space. The grandchildren are all college educated. That's pretty impressive. There's been massive improvement, not only in the ecology, but in socioeconomic circumstances. 
materialism has suggested that wealth is coming from things. But in fact, wealth is coming from ecological function. The benefits of this restoration are felt all across China. The sediment in the Yellow River has been reduced by 80%. It's the healthiest it's been for centuries. With the lessons of the Lus Plateau, you can see that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. But we can also see a next step, the next level of understanding. We're looking at a new age, the age of nature. Pretty inspiring, Johnny. Thank you. My job is to make. <laughs> Pretty inspiring stuff. Has anyone got any comments about that? Uh, no, well, a few. Basically, most people are saying really inspiring. Um, good to see. Uh, one was asking, is nature being maintained in China today? Um, I think that film was made in 2016, the follow up. Um, so, yeah, the thing is, the media, it's not very well, the Lost Plateau project is not very well communicated outside of IUCN or the World Bank, probably because the Western media don't really want to show how, how to scale, the scale of it. I mean, we're talking an area that's like one and a half times the size of Wales restored since 1994. Um, I mean, it's just mind boggling. Uh, I just think um, if they're able to do that on an area that's degraded to that scale, um, they're really sort of light years ahead of us, aren't they? Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's it. I think all of them were just really appreciative comments to seeing that video. Thanks for sharing it. And the talk in general, Johnny, it was really, really good, really informative. Well done. You're welcome. Anytime. Nigel, have you got anything else to add before, before I finish this off? No, just fi final thanks, Jonathan. You put together <coughs> A great case for what you're doing so well and thank you very much it's, it's clear from the comments how much your talk's been appreciated and how inspiring it, it has been thank you very much indeed for this evening's presentation you're welcome thanks nigel nice to see you again and you okay that's it yeah i'll um stop recording now thank you very much thank you for, for joining us it's been thank you